Have you ever wondered what your dreams mean? Join us in Dream School at thisjungianlife.com and find out. Jung wrote, Dreams are a little hidden door in the innermost and most secret recesses of the soul. Dream School is a unique, self-paced online program you can start at any time that unlocks access to your inner world. Our 12-month program provides the support, knowledge, and guidance you need to reach within, decipher your personal dream code, and harness it to optimize your life. By enrolling, you'll join an affirming community of fellow travelers, each pursuing a unique quest. And it's fun. Join us on an adventure to wholeness and healing through understanding your dreams. Go to thisjungianlife.com and click on Dream School. You'll be taken to our secure checkout. Once you join, you'll get immediate access to our first three modules. You can get started right away. We look forward to seeing you there. Welcome to this Jungian Life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, uh, we are going to talk about the cosmic meaning of consciousness. And that is a phrase uh, directly from Jung. And it's really portentous, momentous, and almost too much to wrap our minds around. And we are going to try because nothing could be more important for each of us and for the world. So with that, I am going to read a passage uh, from Jung's memoir, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. It's fairly long, and I would like you to let yourself be read to for a minute or two, and then we will start reflecting on this, uh, which is incredibly important as a Jungian concept in itself. Uh, He talks about a revelation of consciousness when he is in Africa, in Kenya. And it's his discovery of the new myth, uh, which we'll be articulating as we go along. He experienced it subjectively. And he says, From Nairobi, we used a small ford to visit the Athi Plains, a great game preserve, From a low hill in this broad savanna, a magnificent prospect opened out to us. To the very brink of the horizon, we saw gigantic herds of animals, gazelle, antelope, gnu, zebra, warthog, and so on. Grazing, heads nodding, the herds moved forward like slow rivers. There was scarcely any sound save the melancholy cry of a bird of prey. This was the stillness of the eternal beginning, the world as it had always been, in the state of non-being, for until then no one had been present to know that it was this world. I walked away from my companions until I had put them out of sight and savored the feeling of being entirely alone. There I was now, the first human being to recognize that this was the world, but who did not know that in this moment he had first really created it. There the cosmic meaning of consciousness became overwhelmingly clear to me. Quote, what nature leaves imperfect, the art perfects, end quote, say the alchemists. Man, I, in an invisible act of creation, put the stamp of perfection on the world by giving it objective existence. This act we usually ascribe to the Creator alone, without considering that in so doing we view life as a machine, calculated down to the last detail, 
which, along with the human psyche, runs on senselessly, obeying foreknown and predetermined rules. In such a cheerless clockwork fantasy, there is no drama of man, world, and God. There is no new day leading to new shores, but only the dreariness of calculated processes. My old Pueblo friend came to my mind. He thought that the raison d'etre of his Pueblo had been to help their father, the sun, to cross the sky each day. I had envied him for the fullness of meaning in that belief and had been looking about without hope for a myth of our own. Now I knew what it was and knew even more that man is indispensable for the completion of creation, that in fact he himself is the second creator of the world who alone has given to the world its objective existence without which unheard, unseen, silently eating, giving birth, dying, heads nodding through hundreds of millions of years, it would have gone on in the profoundest night of non-being down to its unknown end. Human consciousness created objective existence and meaning, and man found his indispensable place in the great process of being. That is an incredible declaration, and from this we can distill two components of what Jung uh, has discovered as the new myth. First, the creator sees himself through the eyes of man's consciousness. In other words, our consciousness really matters. And second, Man's consciousness is a second world creator, and that is the objective existence that we as reflective human beings can bring to the world. So with all that, uh, let us begin our explorations, perambulations, and uh, other meaning-making processes. When I imagine this worldview, that human beings provide a quality of objective consciousness that the God image cannot generate itself, it presupposes the unified field that Jung writes about in his work on synchronicity, that we have to feel our way into the idea that all the way from the subtlest archetypal and spiritual dimensions, there is an unbroken spectrum of force of life that reaches into the densest matter. And if we imagine that, and on some level accept it, then it makes sense that human beings would be organs of the divine. And that what happens to matter has a relationship to the highest archetypal or spiritual planes. Of course, that's already happening with nature. But as Jung mentions, there is a kind of blindness to the laws of nature. And human beings, as these relatively new organs of the divine, are able to contribute consciousness, meaning, self-reflection, philosophy, theory, and feed that into this collective field. How that influences the divine is a marvelous stretch of imagination. To consider that God is enhanced by the experiences of human beings is to change the static view of the divine, and to think that the God image is in fact evolving. This is something that Jung took up in his volume of Ion, that he titled Ion, and using the anthropologic resources that he had at 
that time, he traced the way God was imaged across a large span of time and theorized that something must be happening between man and the divine, or at least the image of the divine, that was reciprocal and moved back and forth, which also suggests that there will be a new time when humanity will reimagine the image of God, and that image will inspire the imaginations of human beings in new directions. He worked on this in Ion, but then felt that he hadn't really fully said what he wanted to. He'd been too diplomatic and tentative, and actually something in him really wanted to get the full story out. So toward the end of the li- his life, he had this experience of sort of dictating in one sitting, essentially, his uh, short book, Answer to Job. So in some sense, it was a similar creative process to the seven sermons to the dead that happened to him earlier in life. But he really was wrestling with this idea that you were just talking about, Joseph, the transformation of the God image. But, but in some sense, it's not just, he's not talking just about the way that human culture personifies the divine. He's really talking about the nature of the divine being changed by being known by human consciousness. So there's this wonderful short quote from Answer to Job that sort of sums up the whole thing, and it's this. Whoever knows God has an effect on him. I think that we're saying the same thing. What Jung moves from, just as you noted, was his attempt to make this empirical, because the image of God is something that universally human beings can regard even looking at ancient artwork or artifacts. But to imagine the invisible archetypal reality behind it as an evolving force and that human beings contribute to that. And for him to state it so boldly, as you said, suggests an evolution in his consciousness because his earlier publications seemed very conservative And he writes very openly that he's trying to protect the integrity of his reputation as a psychiatrist and Mm. as a scientist. And now that we have some relationship to the Red Book and the Black Books, we can see that he was having these mystical experiences and was really concerned about talking about God and the gods so directly. But he transcends this with uh, the answer to Job, seven sermons, I believe, when he initially wrote it, he was thinking he was going to keep that secret. The implications, I think, of this unbelievably audacious thinking and experience, Mm -hmm. many experiences make it plural by Jung, for each of us, are really um, mind shaking. Mm-hmm. Each of us, each of you, matters that much in terms of how we grow, how we evolve, what we dedicate our lives to, what our values are, that our own consciousness affects the cosmos. And there's a wonderful quote from Jung about this. As far as we can discern, the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light in the darkness of mere being. Uh, So as much as we can transform our own shadows and unconsciousness into awareness makes a difference. Yeah, I mean, Jung really, really believed this, that the work that each individual does in terms of becoming more conscious changes the fate of the world. He was asked once about, uh, you know, what he foresaw for the future. It was toward the end of his life. It's in the middle of the Cold War. The specter of nuclear disaster hung over the world. And he said something like, you know, the fate of humanity hangs by a a slender thread. And what will make the difference is 
the work of individuals to bring forth what's in them, to become more conscious, to become more conscious of their shadow. And he says something very similar. I wanna I just want to read it slightly different phrasing, but he's saying the same thing. This is this is from uh the collected works, uh volume nine I. He says, but why on earth, you may ask, should it be necessary for man to achieve by hook or by crook a higher level of consciousness? This is truly the crucial question, and I do not find the answer easy. Instead of a real answer, I can only make a confession of faith. I believe that after thousands and millions of years, someone had to realize that this wonderful world of mountains and oceans, suns and moons and galaxies and nebulae, plants and animals, exists. All nature seeks this goal and finds it fulfilled in man, but only in the most highly developed and most fully conscious man. Every advance, even the smallest, along this path of conscious realization adds that much to the world. Joseph, I am thinking that you are familiar with the myth about the shards being uh, descending to the earth and then being made whole again, and that that is a wonderful way of imaging how and that each of us matters. I think this sentiment, thank you, Deb, that human beings are essential in the divine plan shows up in other mythologies and religious texts. In Lurianic Judaism, which is based and focused primarily on the Kabbalah, the creation myth assumes that in the beginning there was a void without any qualities at all, without consciousness, without form. And somehow God creates a void within the space of itself. And into that void, he projects a structure, which we call the tree of life, 10 spheres of force in various relationship to each other and to the divine. After this initial structure of the universe is made, God pours his essence, his consciousness, his life force into the structure. And the lower half of the structure shatters and shards of light, shards of consciousness and of the divine splinter and fall to the bottom of this void. The error in the creation of the first tree of life is that each of the spheres, in other words, each of the archetypes, only receives power, but it did not express that power. God reformulates this blueprint of the universe and creates a reciprocity in these 10 primary archetypes, the 10 Sephiroth, so that they receive and emanate force. Man is created and given one of many purposes to awaken in consciousness adequately to discern these shards of consciousness that have fallen out of the divine order. In fact, Isaac Luria went so far as to say that each human being is born with a responsibility, an assignment of discovering a certain number of these shards of light and restoring them to the divine order. In that tradition, it's thought that contemplating on this archetypal image and the various qualities of it in the tree of life, that these shards of light are affected. But I think that we could reconceptualize that contemplative work in terms of Jung's model. I think that what that is leaning towards is the work of moving through the world, penetrating certain compelling events in our lives, and being able to consciously discern 
the archetypal components in these various experiences for each person to recognize that. And in recognizing its archetypal center, it is restored to a larger cosmology of divine forces. And that changes how we imagine what's happening, how we respond to it. And if we step back into that mystical world, actually forges a link between that spiritual or archetypal center and the manifestation that we're seeing in front of us. It establishes a link so that what's happening in front of us can evolve to express more of its full potential. Now, that's easier to think about in the human personality, but more radically to imagine that that actually could happen through the intervention of a human being reflecting on an outer event. Jung doesn't say that quite exactly, but using that amplification, I think he is pointing in that direction. So can you maybe give a hypothetical example of what you're thinking of, Joseph? I'm thinking of Brian Feldman's work with uh, mothering and child rearing. One of the things that he was focused on is filming and describing the dyadic relationship between mothers and their infants. And he was particularly concerned about mothers who were under enormous stress or they themselves were carrying any number of deprivations and traumas and how their style of mothering was influencing infant outcomes. When he began to introduce the mothers to a different aesthetic of mothering, introducing them to the archetypal beauty of mothering, both through dialogue, through art, through storytelling, through myth, through coaching, that he would see by acknowledging that archetypal reality of beauty and life-giving nurturance, that the mothers in this study would begin not only to change their particular behaviors, but they began to fall in love with their children and delight in them, which is something that they weren't evidencing before. So that's another way of saying that he's looking at this dyad, he sees the archetypal potential in this living mother-child relationship, and then does what he can to stimulate that spiritual potential. And when that was successful, it concretely deepened and enriched the lived experience. Mm -hmm. So that uh, really uh, helps to bring forward in a really powerful way uh, the relationship between these archetypal forces and their translation into lived human life and relationship. We grow, we evolve in relationship, and that is a connection to something greater, something beautiful, something inspirational. We also um, are aware of the work of Kwame Scruggs, who has a program for young African-American men using elders, drumming, myth, and what that does to inspire and spark an aliveness, the aliveness of expanded consciousness, expanded sense of self. This example, as well as yours, Joseph, with Brian Feldman's work, you know, really illustrate how do we bring those sparks of the divine down to earth or recover the shards as, as you had it in your mythological retelling and reconnect to a greater whole. And I think this is an essential taproot of Jungian work, particularly, 
There are certain books that Jungians have written over time that have had an impact on the culture. Clarissa Pinkola Este's book, Women Who Run With the Wolves, through her storytelling, through the fairy tales, the myths, and through her insights about the archetypes that influence women's consciousness, women reported feeling changed. That by reflecting on these archetypal images and themes, something shifted in their own psyches. And one way of interpreting that is some aspect of the divine became more accessible and began to express in this curative way. Robert Moore's book, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, tries to evoke those four masculine archetypes. For some men who are attentive in this way, they felt that by recognizing the archetypes, some of those forces could activate medicinally inside of themselves and mature their personality. And this process of recognizing the archetype, which then leads to a shift of values, priorities, and libido in the individual is, I think, very similar to the spirit of Tikkun Olam. Now, the presupposition that we were making earlier is not only does that help an individual's life, but the individual who is striving to hold the king archetype feeds something back into the archetype itself. And I think it has to do with images and impressions, that it contributes to the library of images that clothe the archetype and is still alive after the individual passes away, that there is a kind of collective unconscious imprint that does not dissolve. And this leads to Jung's basic feeling that archetypes are a priori, that the archetypes exist before we're born, which means there is some kind of recording mechanism that exists in a way that is very mysterious and probably not simply genetic. You know, I'm thinking about what you've been saying, Joseph, and I'm, I'm thinking about how we're, we're talking in some sense here about our relationship with the divine. And Jung had the quote, called or not, God will be present, carved above his home. And it's also on his grave, by the way. This sense that even if we're not thinking about it, God is looking for us. God is coming to meet us somewhere. And he also said, without knowing it, man is always concerned with God. So there's a way that we are also always looking for God, whether or not we even realize it. So I'm realizing that I'm using a kind of fluid terms. Sometimes I'm talking about archetype. Sometimes I'm talking about God. And both of them are ways of languaging that transcendental component of life. And as Jung became more bold in putting his philosophy forward, became part of the cosmology. Yeah. L let me share a quote from Jung just on that, sort of what, what is the nature of this thing that we're talking about here? So this is from one of his lectures. He says, for the collective unconscious, we could use the word God. You all know what the collective unconscious is. You have certain dreams that carry the hallmark of the collective unconscious. Instead of dreaming of aunt this or uncle that, you dream of a lion. And then the analyst will tell you that this is a mythological motif. And you will understand that is the collective unconscious. So you get the collective unconscious right there. This God is no longer miles of abstract space away from you in an extra mundane sphere, 
this divinity is not a concept in a theological textbook or in the Bible. It is an immediate thing. It happens in your dreams at night. It causes you to have pains in the stomach, diarrhea, constipation, a whole host of neuroses. If you try to formulate it to think what the collective unconscious is after all, you wind up by concluding that it is what the prophets were concerned with. It sounds exactly like some things in the Old Testament. There God sends plagues upon people. He burns their bones in the night. He injures their kidneys. He causes all sorts of troubles. Then you come naturally to the dilemma. Is that really God? Is God a neurosis? Now that is a shocking dilemma, I admit. But when you think consistently and logically, you come to the conclusion that God is a most shocking problem. <laughs> if we lean into Jung's language, let's, let's start by just refreshing the idea of what a neurosis is. And my understanding is, in, in the simplest terms, that it's a kind of splitting, much like the breaking of the vessels, that there is a fundamental wholeness that we are born into, and that sometimes just through ordinary life, there's certain things that are split away. So that by the time, you know, we reach puberty or a bit beyond, there's an awful lot of things that have been left in the unconscious and left there very, very much alive. When we imagine the collective unconscious being added to that, there are endless oceans of images and forces that a single human being could not possibly incarnate. It would just tear us apart to have that much coming in. If we think that the entire collective unconscious is synonymous with God, we could understand how we would have to split off, that we would almost have to protect ourselves as small egos from the overwhelming fullness and power of what God implies. And yet, we still long for a union with that fullness that could threaten to tear our consciousness apart if it inhabited us in all its fullness. It's a tremendous paradox that I think he's vibrating in. Yeah, and it's it's not only that we yearn to do this, it's that as we've been landing, it's that somehow that's our mission. You know, that we have to help God across the sky every day. We have to add to the human project by becoming more conscious and by having this relationship with this thing. And so we could even say that a neurosis is a call to know God. Because the neurosis or the split causes a kind of suffering that brings our attention to something over and over and over again because it calls us to brood upon it. Yeah, you know, the neurosis uh, is an unconscious expression of, of something that is yearning and pressing uh, to, be, to be conscious. And it may be misapplied to, you know, something of very high value or, you know, a symptom. It is worth attending to because it does want to find its right object. And Jung talks about his experience treating someone who, who was actually the physicist of Wolfgang Pauli, where this was at issue. He says, fortunately, the man had religio. That is, he carefully took account of his experiences, and he had enough pistis, or loyalty to his experience, to enable him to hang on to it and continue it. He had the great advantage of being neurotic. And so, whenever he tried to be disloyal to his experience or to deny the voice, the neurotic condition instantly came back. He simply could not quench the fire. And finally, he had to admit the incomprehensibly numinous character of his experience. He had to confess that the unquenchable fire was holy. 
this was the sine qua non of his cure. It really points up what you were saying, Lisa, about um, the carving above Jung's house of called or not, God will be present. But how we image God, what we attend to, what the focus and center of that is, that's up to us. It can be a neurosis, or we can help God make the sun rise each morning and know that we are in relation to something greater. It's quite an enormous shift of attitude to even philosophically believe that we are constantly co-participating with the universe. And in some of these tribes that Jung had visited, it was so extraordinary and inspiring for him to learn from these people what it felt like for them to sense that their actions, their way of being, influenced something as extraordinary as the sun. It created a field around them that Jung was affected by. And that goes to what we were saying earlier, that there are certain relationships with these ideas that create a kind of field that influences people who are close by or who are interacting with those people. And Jung wrote about being just struck by the substantiveness of these ideas and the people who lived in them. Mm -hmm. And in in some sense, our modern-day suffering is because we're not living inside a myth like this. We don't have a sense of how we're connected to the transcendent. And then we get a neurosis, right? And that causes us to have to to yes. figure it out. That's like the <laughs> the God image presents itself to us as a phobia or as OCD or as uh, anxiety. It's like, yeah, that's the God image coming into your life and demanding that you get to know it. I think this is echoed in Jung's criticisms of the excessive reliance on the intellect, that right now we are in a cycle of prioritization of intellect and scientific triumph, which has granted us enormous benefits, undoubtedly. But the intellect gains power through its ability to dissect That dissection has allowed human beings to rival the power of the gods in as much as we can reconfigure the genes using CRISPR, and we can create new elements that didn't exist before. The downside is, as we were pointing to, is the movement away from the more synthetic, intuitive, and feeling level that allows us to sense irrationally our relationship to these transpersonal forces. So one of Jung's primary therapeutic attitudes was to champion the synthetic view versus the reductive view, to champion the knitting together and moving forward versus the taking apart of something. And so often in his dream analysis with clients and his interactions, he was more interested in where things were moving and where the wholeness and the recognition of wholeness was calling people to resolve the neurotic split and to resolve the suffering that that creates in people. I wanted to circle back to something that was also brought up, that human consciousness is the second creator. That is radical. Yes. uh, Inspiring. Awesome (laughs) declaration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what does one do with that? It's, uh, you know, from a more um, kind of cognitive 
approach that may be helpful here. It's the difference between subjective experience and objective experience. And uh, Jung talked a lot about that in the long quote that I read at the beginning, the objective point of view. And we experience this in ourselves when we're subjectively caught up in anything, uh, a game we're playing or a, a television program uh, or something as momentous as childbirth. We're, we're not watching ourselves experience it. We're in it. The objective experience is when we can step back and look at it and realize that we're seeing it and kind of take ourselves out of being immersed in it. And uh, so what I'm thinking about um, in the context of the audacious statement Jung makes that um, consciousness is a second world creator is the ability to observe it as presumably the animal life Jung witnessed in Africa cannot. The antelope and the gazelles graze, and they are in it, but they don't have that objective viewpoint that, as far as we know, only mankind does. So what I think I'm about to do here is take this really lofty, rarefied idea that we've been circling and, and bring it down and perhaps do a little bit of violence to it and bringing it all the way down here, but I'm going to risk that. We're partly talking here about reflective capacity, yes. which is just sort of a straight up uh, psychodynamic term that means that we as individuals are able to think about ourselves with some objectivity and not be in an immediate identification with every feeling that we have. And I think this idea that our ability to observe is a second world creator has a kind of very, let's say, practical corollary in some of the ideas of cognitive behavioral therapy, that how we look at things actually changes our experience of reality so that, and, and I again, I'm, I'm bringing this all the way down to a very simple level but but i think there's there's some continuum here on which these things both exist that you know if a friend uh doesn't return your phone call you can either see that as a slight and a rejection but absent any other information it could just be that your friend didn't get the message or was very busy and and so it's being able to hold some space around the meaning that we make of things. And I think the fact that human beings can make meaning, whether the meaning is painful to the individual or whether it feels inspiring to them, just the fact that human beings have a choice, have a palette of ideas, orientations, and attitudes allows them to create this second world inside of themselves that moves concordantly with the outer world. And as you said, taking some objective hold of the narrative inside of us can remake that second world and mediate some of the ways that we adapt to things. I want to take a little pivot in a slightly different direction and talk about how our knowing God changes God. I want to go back to that idea a little bit because it's something that is inherent very early on in Jung's thinking. You know, Deb, the quote that you read at the beginning makes it really clear that God is not just something out there that we have to, uh, I don't know, worship, let's say, but that we have to wrestle with God. And I'm thinking of Jacob wrestling with the angel, that, there's, that it requires engagement and I think we see something like this in the story in MDR about his kind of intrusive, sort of obsessive thought. I, th I think it, it's sort of in that direction of like an intr intrusive thought that he had about um, God shitting on the cathedral in Basel, mm -hmm. you know, that, that in order to have the religious experience, he had to let himself imagine that. He was, I think he was a teenager at the time that this happened. Yeah. But it was, it was like, no, God's not just out there. 
somehow I have to have this direct experience of him. And then he takes that up in a, in a much more sophisticated way in answer to Job at the end of his life. And really the, the thesis in answer to Job is really quite stunning because what he's, what he's telling us is that God treated Job unfairly and Job recognized this. And because Job was consciously aware that God had, Yahweh had treated him unfairly, Yahweh had to change as a result of that. And the way that he changed was for him to become man. So the implication of this is that the book of Job was the necessary predecessor to the incarnation of man as Christ because Yahweh wasn't very conscious. He was just inflicting pain and suffering on Job, you know, really without any reason. And, and so God had to change and evolve. And I'm, I'm going to read a little quote here from Edward Edinger. If something doesn't reach consciousness, it doesn't exist. Jung's insight about this state of affairs effectively answers Job and, of course, not only the Job of antiquity, but Job as the archetype of all of suffering humanity that has been obliged to suffer unjustly because of the nature of reality. Because as Jung tells us here, God is reality itself. So this is this fundamental fact that God, as in the, in the guise of reality, imposes suffering on us sometimes unfairly and that engaging with that truth creates a kind of evolution of consciousness on the level of humanity as i'm meditating on that incredible work that jung did in the answer to job and leaning back into the description of job's horrible sufferings it makes me think that God is synonymous with nature in that way of thinking because the sufferings of Job are all part of him being subject to nature that is red in tooth and claw, that the amoral nature of sickness and death and misfortune and having your house burned down and um, having a child pass away, the ruthlessness of nature that we barely pay attention to unless we live very close to nature. So the divine being synonymous with nature is amoral and totally indifferent to human suffering. And yet one of the things that we have done at least in this modern age and perhaps since the beginning of civilization, is to take what we learn about nature and reconfigure it to come to us with a kinder continence, to be able to take the laws of aerodynamics and instead of falling off a cliff, somebody realize how to make a plane, to be able to use that same ruthless law of gravity which is an extension of the divine and human beings figuring out how to make that into something extraordinary, how to look at the ravages of a virus or a bacteria and human beings turning a kind face to the issue and creating vaccines or creating medicines that mediate the effects of this ruthless aspect of nature. So it's through human consciousness that a kind of mercy is introduced into nature itself. Now, one could make an argument in the modern world for whether or not we've done that as skillfully as one could have imagined, because we also live in this world of unintended consequences. You know, it seemed like a really good idea to introduce rabbits to Australia until they overtook the entire continent. But human beings have that 
godlike power to reconfigure, you know, a continent by making a decision like that. But many of the decisions rose from a desire to mediate and control suffering. So I'm wondering if that's part of this this humanization of nature that then becomes conceptually the humanization of God. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. But I'm also thinking that it happens on another level as well. So mm-hmm. there is the way that that humankind sort of perfects nature as you as you will, as you were talking about Joseph. And and then there's the way that we can't domesticate God, that we can't domesticate nature. And I think that's in that realm of the unintended consequences. And then the mediation occurs at the level of meaning making so that we take the suffering that's imposed by reality, by nature, by God, by the unconscious, whatever word you want to use, and we suffer it and we make meaning from it. And that transforms the experience. It's not just an idiot on a stage full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Mm -hmm. So what's constellating in my imagination is the idea of the Lord of the dance. And this metaphor for the divine as the dancer suggests a kind of ordering possibility in the universe in the same way that dance takes human movement to a higher arc. And in that lovely Shaker hymn, Turn, turn, wherever ye may be, I am the Lord of the dance, said he, that there's an implication that that is a reference to the image of Christ, that the incarnation or the humanization of the divine becomes the dancer, and the dance becomes a metaphor for the ability that human beings have to make meaning, to make a dance out of the vicissitudes, sufferings, and incomprehensible reality of nature and life. So maybe to finish, we'll go back to the quote that Deb shared with us in the beginning that we can feel ourselves to be living inside a myth in which we know that we are indispensable for the completion of creation. That's lovely. It's hard to imagine a segue from that into a dream, which can be so terrestrial, but uh, as lords of the dance, we'll just uh, spin to the right and, and take a moment into a dream. Hey, Lisa, what's been going on about your book? Well, it was released on May 25th, and sales have been strong. And I've been receiving so many lovely emails and texts and phone calls from from friends and from uh, people that I don't know telling me how much they've enjoyed the book. And so that feels really great. The reviews on Amazon have all been glowing, and that's been really heartening. It's just really wonderful to know that this project of mine is resonating with so many people. I'm just uh, so happy for you, and it's such a lovely, lovely book, both deep and accessible, about the inner journey around being a mother. It's never been, that's never been written about. It hasn't been out there. And that it's getting such an enthusiastic, heartfelt reception. That's wonderful. Yeah. I would love it if listeners who've read the book could write a review on Amazon because (laughs) although there are many wonderful ones there, um, more is always better. So thanks in advance for that. You've really incarnated something that was in the ethers that needed to be pulled down, needed to be shaped in words, and needed to be made accessible. And proof in the pudding is that it's beginning to have a kind of life of its own in the collective. <laughs> yes. That speaks a lot to the timeliness of this. Yeah, I think you're right, Joseph. The, the analogy to a baby is just too rich and too good and too multifaceted to be <laughs> missed. <laughs> it's having a life of its own, which yeah. is just what we want. That's mm. right.
Today's dreamer is 34 years old. Uh, she is a communications specialist and editor, and here is her dream. I am in a home I don't recognize, babysitting a young boy. He's probably seven or eight years old. We're on a couch reading a book together. The mood is fun and playful. Then the boy notices movement in the hallway leading to the front door. I don't see anything at first, but then I track a dim light like a flashlight moving along the wall. I know then that someone else is in the house. I stand up from the couch and move toward the hallway. Three older women have entered the house. They look to be in their 50s or 60s with long, draping clothes. They look like ordinary women and do not appear threatening, but I immediately feel a menacing energy. I ask them who they are and what they are doing in the house. The women brush off my questions and mock me for my concern, suggesting that I am frightening the little boy. They have pushed past the hallway and are now in the kitchen. Their forcefulness tells me that they are here with ill intent, and I fear they are here to rob the family. I grab the little boy and take him upstairs and hide him in his room while I deal with the old women. But when I am closing the boy's bedroom door to go back downstairs, the women are already on the second floor of the house, entering all the rooms, opening drawers and cabinets, and taking things. They seem to be everywhere and yet their movements are not chaotic, but very controlled and methodical in a way that is unsettling to me. They seem particularly intent on taking books, paper files, and personal documents. I begin to think about what the family might have that the women want, what value is here that I had not known about. I remember or realize that the father is a famous novelist, and I wonder if maybe the women are trying to steal his work. I try to stop them, but they won't listen to me, and I wonder how I am going to explain this to the family later. After following them around for a bit, I take the boy back downstairs. I decide to call 911 and leave the house until help arrives. I am barefoot and carrying the boy on my hip as I walk away from the house. While I wait for the 911 responder to answer, I realize that I do not know the house's address. The dream ends before I find out whether help arrives. And for context, the dreamer says, I am in a relationship with a man I care for, but have deep uncertainty about being with. I'm trying to figure out whether to stay and try to renew the relationship or leave and feel unable to share my feelings and confusion honestly with even my closest friends. The main feelings in the dream, she reports, were confusion, annoyance, anxiety, and vague danger. And for some additional context, she adds, I have dreamt about three women entering a house before at a time when I was experiencing a lot of inner conflict, although in the previous dream, they were younger women. Well, I just love this dream. <laughs> <laughs> I just love this dream. It, 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 it's very much like a fairy tale. It feels like a fairy tale. Yeah. What do you love about it? Say more. What oh, are you seeing in it? So much. Well, first of all, we have this image of three women, which corresponds mythologically with the Mori, the Fates, or the Norn in uh, Greek or Norse mythology. So these are perhaps images of the goddess, of the goddesses of fate who spin and weave and cut the thread of a man's life. And so here it is, your destiny has arrived. And, you know, they're, they're older women with drapey clothes, so they look ordinary, but really they're kind of witchy, right? Yes. They're, they're yeah. images of the yeah. goddess. And I found myself uh, writing down this phrase, what value is here that I hadn't known about? The ego, 
the dream ego is not aware of the great value in this house. But these women know. I appreciated that, that there's a quaternity of women in, with, included with the dream ego. So there's an intimation of wholeness here. And I appreciated her uh, relationship with the little boy. I thought it was interesting that the little boy was the first one to notice the movement. So some young kind of animus energy is perhaps initially receptive to their entry. And that they their first appearance is with a dim light as a flashlight, so kind of a dawning consciousness. The opposition here uh, between the, the three women methodically going through the house, just very calmly and purposefully, you know, which is not characteristic of burglars, uh, and the dream ego who perceives this as menacing and threatening is a perfect illustration of something that we say a lot, which is uh, that the attitude of the dream ego is often the least trustworthy attitude in the dream because there is all kinds of uh, evidence here as this story unfolds that something very purposeful is happening. Uh, this is not an intruder. And it is the young Animus, the little boy who notices the movement and is alert to it. And I agree with you, Lisa, of that uh, the part of the dream where she says, uh, I begin to think about what the women want. And there is value here that I had not known about. The house she is in is the house of a man, another animus image who's off stage, so to speak, who is a famous novelist. And she is a communications specialist. Yes, I noticed that. An <laughs> and editor. editor. Yes. So, you know, there feels like something that, that the telos, the possibility, the future that is being hinted at here is where this value is in her, since everything in the dream is about her. The house, the boy, uh, the intruders, they are all aspects of her. And uh, I love this dream too. And I would want to say, wow, you know, wh where is that in you? Where's the value? Where's the novelist? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and the, the image of the father as a famous novelist is sort of a progressed version of the little boy. Yes, mm -hmm. so exactly. So we, yeah. we imagine, you know, the, her kind of animus energy now is a little eight or nine-year-old boy. And let me just look back at it for a second, because their initial, the initial thing they're doing is uh, they're reading a book together. Oh, <gasps> That's right. Where he's destined to go is to become a famous novelist, in a sense. Like, they're both sort of images of the same energy yeah. at different t points in time. Now, it's interesting to me that although this dream seems very much like a dream about her own inner growth and direction, that she associates it with a relationship that she has with a man that she is uncertain about. I'm so curious about her feeling that she can't share her confusion with even close friends. I resonate with the, all the things that you guys have said. I find myself circling around the issue of control, that she, the ego, cannot keep the house sealed and under control. So that seems to be one of the primary messages that something is going to be permeable or broken into, regardless of whether or not you like it. Once the three women are in the house and they're surveying, cataloging, perhaps preparing to take things, but everything in the house is being touched, examined, in a sense, consciousness is being brought to all these hidden contents, because she cannot keep the house separated and sealed off she then tries to keep the boy separated and sealed off. So the same intention tries to go forward. She calls 911, again looking for reinforcements to seal off the house, 
to seal her off from the effect of the three old women. So I think your analysis that the three old women could represent these archetypal forces, could represent something about her own aging process. When we think that there are four women in the dream, three old women plus her makes four women a quaternity. There is a opportunity for wholeness if she could engage the old women and perhaps even join them on the quest to search for something. Mm -hmm. Because I can imagine they're looking for something and she already intuits they're looking for something that's valuable in the house that ostensibly she may not know about because it's not a home she recognizes. If the old women find the valuable thing in her psyche, it remains to be seen what they're going to do with it, but she'd rather protect the boy than find the treasure in the house. So I think there's some interesting opportunities for her to perhaps join the search for what's valuable. I like the idea that the boy has a progression, which could be the novelist father. Mm -hmm. Secondary to that, she's carrying a boy and she feels deeply responsible. I thought when you were referencing her relationship, is it possible that she's carrying the relationship as if she's carrying a boy and protecting the relationship or even her lover from the vicissitudes of life or from a sense of being invaded in some way. And that sealing off energy seems to be happening in her discussion of the relationship when she says that she can't tell anybody about what's going on. It's another sealing off and isolation, although she may feel it's justified. I really appreciate that, uh, Joseph. And I'm doing a little bit of a change of uh, focus here with the image of the house. Uh, in her context, she says she dreamt about three women entering a house before during a period of inner conflict. And at the end of the dream itself, she can't tell the 911 people what the address of the house is. She doesn't know what it is. And then I'm backing up to the very beginning. I am in a home I don't recognize. So our, our house is where we live. It reflects us. It's the locus and, and focus of our personal life, or so I hope. And I am curious about what that image may portend in her own psyche and how she could, in my own imagination, move into this house, how she could recognize the house and make it more familiar rather than having these auxiliaries go through the house and explore all the papers and documents of, is this um, an image of a home that she could or should be moving into, metaphorically speaking, recognize it and know its, its address, where that is in her I, I want to maybe expand on that a little bit, Deb, because I was thinking something similarly. I have an intuition about what this dream might be about, and of course it could be completely wrong, but uh, I'm making it up, so consider it my my personal fantasy about, about what this dream means for this dreamer. I feel that it might be saying something about her relationship with her own creativity, Yes. And it's not it's not a house she recognizes. It's also not her son. And and I I don't imagine that this dreamer has children, but m many times we dream of having a child even if we don't have children. But this is specifically a child she's babysitting. So there's a sense that the house doesn't belong to her, the child doesn't belong to her. There's something that hasn't been claimed here. And yes, I feel it's very significant at the end of the dream that she doesn't even know the address. And this might link it to the relationship. We don't know her concerns about the relationship. But a lot of times when a woman has a strong creative drive that is unacknowledged and unclaimed, that can get projected out into her relationship. So she might wind up with a very creative man and then in, in 
you know, the worst case scenario, she winds up spending all of her energy supporting his creative efforts. Or it might be that she's in a relationship where there are expectations of her that thwart her from being creative. So if the dream is speaking into this dilemma with the relationship, I wonder it's, if it's in this way. My sense is that the little boy is her child, that the, it is her house, that she hasn't known it yet. She hasn't allowed herself to admit it to her, her allowed to admit herself yet that, that this is her destiny. And these women have come to, to kind of let her know that, to put her on notice that it's her destiny, perhaps, to be a great novelist. Mm -hmm. You know, I think all of us, uh, and Joseph, and what you were saying about the treasure instead of leaving the house, uh, I think all of us have an intimation that there is treasure here for her to claim. And we've been coming at it from slightly different angles uh, and not as directly and explicitly expressed as you just said at least. But I think we're all in the same place. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.